It has been, Nancy, and my, my privilege to uh, know Johnny and Pam Oxendine for quite a number of years now, since we have an occasion to go out to California. <laughs> you know, he's been a, a faithful gospel preacher for quite a number of years, but he's been preaching for the San Mateo, California congregation for 18 years. And he's been married to the former Pam Hackworth, Noah Hackworth's daughter. She's here for 30 years, but that can't be true, is it? 30 years? That's a test, because she's sitting back there. If you didn't remember that, <laughs> 30 years. <clears throat> and they were just uh, barely into their teens when they got married. Johnny... Of course, Pam never ages. She... <clears throat> I'm trying to, you know, gain as many points as I can. <laughs> Got a daughter Leslie that uh, and a uh, uh, son Jeremy, I'm at the Drew that uh, lived out there also, and, and Leslie's married to Jeremy Hicks. They also live in San Mateo, and Andrew is a senior at uh, UC Berkeley. You know anything about UC Berkeley? <clears throat> but he's still a good kid. He's really a good kid. <laughs> he's not burned any buildings down, or he hasn't uh, protested against much of anything except the fact that his dad won't buy enough gas and put in the car. But he's uh, he's a good kid. And Johnny he graduated from the University of North Carolina. And he's preached a number of different states. He's uh, co-directed the English lectures with Keith Sisman, and I guess he'll be doing it again this year. Is he co-director or? <laughs> it's been rumored that he's been a co-director with Keith Sisman, but I think there's probably no basis for that rumor. Is that right? We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> But he, he's an accomplished preacher and uh, always interesting to, to hear in. And, of course, I get to edit his, his uh, manuscript, and he's a very accomplished writer as well. So uh, he's going to speak to us about be faithful in attendance to all assemblies of the church. Come speak to us, Johnny. When I first got the invitation from uh, from Sonia, when I first opened it, and <clears throat> again, very appre appreciative and always look forward to coming out here. And <clears throat> let me move along a little bit. I, I looked to see who else was invited. And then I saw Terry Hightower's name. And my first thought went to 2 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. I began the first of my pleadings with the hope that he'd be taken away from me. <laughs> and then I went to my second pleading and his name still appeared on the invitations. I, I figure you brethren have, been, have gone through the three times that he was the thorn in your flesh and Nothing's changed. He's still here and wearing those little funny color shirts. <clears throat> uh, Terry came out to San Mateo. We had a we had a really good time. So <clears throat> now he's getting on me um, about an alleged incident. <clears throat> The lesson this evening, be faithful in attendance to all assemblies of the church. And the verse, Hebrews 10, 25, is one that preachers have preached on, classes have been taught on so many times. 
And yet, every time we go over those verses in that chapter, we still recognize the fact that probably nothing has been more of a headache in congregations. More than encouraging the members to participate in the Christian life by attending the classes, the worship services, the fellowships, not just those things, but everything that the church is involved in, whether it's cleaning at the building or or the need for someone to help out in some benevolent way. That whole idea, of course, preachers, elders more, and preachers uh, where there are no elders, uh, all concerned about where people are. And, and you all probably, we all do the same thing. You look around in the congregation to see who's there, who's not. You make inquiries as to why they're not there. You call them up. You go by and visit. You send cards. This is the kind of thing that every congregation is involved in every single week. And it's a concern. <clears throat> we didn't see you Sunday or Wednesday. Are you all right? Is there something that we can do to help you? You ask that question out of deep concern and sincerity. And the scriptures speak out for the need for brethren to maintain a fellowship at the highest of levels in order to enable or equip one another spiritually, building each other up in the most holy faith. Not only to be prepared for the day of the Lord's coming, but rather, as we are told in 2 Peter 3.12, to yearn for it, to look forward to the day the Lord comes. This fellowship and the approach that I'm probably going to use this evening is one of fellowship. Uh, and the issue of fellowship has been a focus for several years now in the brotherhood as we grapple with the large majority of members who are no longer adhering to the biblical basis or the standard of fellowship. Every time we go out to eat, when we're traveling in the vehicles back and forth from the building, that issue comes up, fellowship. What happened to fellowship? It was said earlier, brethren don't even discuss fellowship anymore in large portions of what used to be considered the conservative brotherhood. Now, as a result of the biases of the flesh, something that Brother John was talking about earlier, we see these friendships, these institutional influences, all of these things have an effect. Jesus, in John chapter 17, speaks loud and clear on the subject of fellowship. As does the Apostle John in his first epistle, 1 John, is defined, described by many New Testament writers. It was described already, defined in the lectureships earlier. But if you turn over to John 17, verses 8 through 14, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. For they are thine, and all mine are thine. I am glorified in them, and now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee, O Holy Father. Keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me, that they may be one. That's the divine ideal. 
that, may, that we may all be one, one in Christ. As he says, we are one. It is that idea that is continued through that particular chapter of the book of John. And this fellowship is spoken of in the book of Acts as we read of the actions of those who had just obeyed the gospel as a result of Peter's preaching. <laughs> now that was quick. <clears throat> and it says there, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship. Now that's an indicator of what mattered for the earliest members of the church. The apostles' doctrine and fellowship. And this, of course, is combined with the verse that we're looking at, Hebrews 10, 25. It seems to me that it describes something significant that is to be adhered to by the church for all time. That literal translation of continued steadfastly means that they were devoting themselves or they were remaining constantly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship, which today gives a better sense of those activities. Those saved, and, and again, think about this in terms of church members today. This is what happened with the first Christians. Devoting themselves to the teaching of the apostles. The teaching they were receiving was the gospel of Christ, the power of God and salvation. For as was said earlier, therein is the righteousness of God revealed. In order to be taught by the apostles whom they were devoting themselves to, they had to have been assembling together. Now the new believers unquestionably felt the necessity of becoming more and more firmly established in the truth and maintaining fellowship with God in Christ. And for this reason, they complied so steadfastly, devotedly, and again that word devotedly, to the teaching of the apostles and the fellowship, the assembling with other brethren. Again, we're talking about that verse in Hebrews 10.25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. But I think this early set of verses in the book of Acts gives us an idea of assembling other than in a worship service. And these early Christians not only desired to be encouraged in their faith, but they also were being identified with this public act, listening to the preaching of the gospel and their active involvement in this fellowship. And not only was there this devotion to the teaching, the doctrine, but the accompanying fellowship that we want to focus on, they must have, and they obviously did, assemble together. And this was the occasion for manifesting, showing forth their fellowship, which term expresses their common participation in their newfound experience. One spiritual body, individually and collectively, one by faith in Christ, inwardly and outwardly, one by confessing Christ and by remaining faithful to the one doctrine of Christ, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One faith and one teaching and thus one body and one fellowship. That was how the church began. It was close-knit. They had a common purpose. When we look at Matthew 6, a verse that you're all familiar with, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Again, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Of course, in time, persecution and other external pressures of life brought to bear many difficulties for the new Christians. Not only were they facing the destructive efforts of these Jewish brethren, or interlopers, one might say, 
whose attempts to destroy the church with false doctrine, but the current religious hierarchy, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, viewed them as part of some, as an odd sect, and of course the Roman authorities. So they were isolated in many ways. And the fellowship that they enjoyed through assembling was one of the few bonds that would allow them to remain strong and grow in the faith. This coming together, to be instructed, this coming together for this fellowship, this coming together to encourage and exhort one another. It was challenging. And throughout the New Testament, we see the intense hatred that they faced, an atmosphere described in the scriptures. If you turn over to John chapter 9, verses 18 through 22, it's just one example of the kind of pressure that many of the people were under. And look at how they, just look at these verses. The Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight until they called the parents of him. Now, they didn't even want to believe that this had happened. And they asked them, asked the parents, Is this your son, who ye say was born blind? How then doth he now see? They're asking. They know, but they're asking the question. His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son, that he was born blind. But by what means he now seeth, we know not. Now why would they say that? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And sometimes people in the church today feel an external pressure. They feel that there's some reason that they, they can't express that they're New Testament Christians. They're afraid that their friends might find out. They're afraid, they're afraid that their parents might find out. They're afraid that their schoolmates or even grown-ups they don't want their co-workers to know. And there are various activities that come about and people make excuses as to why they can't be with the brethren. But well, we're having a, a fellowship at the church building tonight. We'd like all the members to be there. And in every congregation, it seems there are people who make excuses as to why they can't be with the brethren. I think it was last week, I don't know if it was, it may have been the week before, during one of the lessons or perhaps when I was speaking, one of the things that came to my mind, a simple question, if your best friend is not a Christian, you need to reevaluate some things. If your very best friends aren't members of the body of Christ, who are they? Are these the people who care for your souls? His parents answered them and said, We know that this is our son. And he says, But how he came to see, we know not. Or who opened his eyes, we know not. He is of age. Ask him, he shall speak for himself. They said this because they feared the Jews. But the Jews had agreed already. If any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Those are the kinds of things. It caused people to forsake the assemblies. In another passage, nevertheless, the chief rulers also, many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I've mentioned more than once this young person who never told their friends, their, their, their parents were active members of the church, but never told their friends that they were members of the church. Never told their friends that they were Christians. Tried to avoid any, any possible link to the church, not even a photograph. The 
No one would try to trivialize or minimize the enormity of the problems faced by brethren in the first century relative to and inclusive of the hostilities and persecution that Paul lays out, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. But the writer of Hebrews is not isolated from these events when under the influence of, the, of God's spirit, he exhorts them to continue our assembling. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is. But exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. He says in verse 23 to hold fast the confession without wavering. We've had some encouraging lessons today. John Rose, a very passionate lesson. Michael Hatcher, a very passionate lesson. Quit ye like men. Without wavering, which is an encouragement to persevere against the odds and the efforts of those who try to thwart the efforts of saints coming together. I'm sure in just about every congregation represented here, you've seen occasions where one of, one of the people that you've been studying with, they are ready to be baptized and some member of the family is opposed to it. This assembling is of importance not only as it strengthens the brethren at the time of great persecution, but it brings with it an acknowledgement that this is by inference a command. Neglecting the assemblies was not acceptable in the New Testament church in the first century under persecution. Even during a time of persecution, the exhortation was to not forsake the assembly. This forsaking will correlate to neglecting so great a salvation, Hebrews 2, 3, which slips away if not given the most earnest heed, Hebrews 2, 1, as it, described, as it descends into transgression and disobedience. To forsake the assembling of ourselves together is sin. It's sin. It's probably one of those sins that people take very carelessly. We we'll ask the, the question, why is it that you can't be with the brethren tonight? And again, sometimes you're going to have reasons that uh, are acceptable. A person may be ill, a person may be out of town, a person, there may be some sort of an emergency. But what real acceptable answer can be given as to why one would not want to be with the saints studying the word of God involved in some fellowship something that is going to strengthen us something that's going to encourage us in the simplest of rationales we can say that this forsaking of the Various, by way of insinuation, is every assembly removes one from the ongoing fellowship that results when these assemblies take place. When you are not a part of the assembly, you are not a part of the fellowship. When saints come together to worship God in spirit and truth, there's fellowship. When we come together to study scripture together, there's fellowship. When we come, for, uh, come together for a meal and a joyful, uh, and joyful entertainment, there is fellowship. When we went to Whataburger and uh, Terry Hightower over there sloshed the rest of that soda on Dub's suit, there was some sort of fellowship. <laughs> To abandon brethren is to abandon the exhortation and encouragement we are to provide one another. Hebrews 10.25 When you aren't at the assembly, which 
ever of those assemblies that there may be, you are neglecting someone else of exhortation. You are refusing them the encouragement that they may need. It is vital to remaining true to the faith. We cannot absolve, absolve ourselves of the responsibility that the Lord has placed upon us because to do so is sin. As Jesus explains, and of course this came up earlier today, John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Now Jesus, the master teacher, can say the most in the fewest words. And we might think we love him, or we might presume that there is a love, or we might give the impression that there is a love for God, but if we do not keep his commandments, we do not love him. It's that simple. You hear it when you speak with people who will tell you, oh, they, they really do love Jesus. And then you explain to them about baptism and they don't want to hear it. Or they, they really love Jesus, but when you try to explain to them that speaking in tongues is another language and they don't want to hear it. Or you explain to brethren about fellowship through association and they don't want to hear it. Forsaking or neglecting is, in essence, a withdrawal from fellowship. It is an announcement that whatever is ordained of God, either through the ordinances found in the scriptures or the decisions made by congregational agreement, is of little to no importance. If the congregation, if the church decides that there is going to be a class or they decide that there is going to be a fellowship and you decide to withdraw your fellowship, because that is the decision that's been made. Then that means that that's of little to no importance to you. It is diametrically opposed to the exhortation found in Hebrews. Let us draw near in verse 22. That exhortation literally means to move forward. A possible implication in certain contexts of a reciprocal relationship between the person approaching and the one being approached. The writer has in mind a similar illustration to the throne of grace referenced Hebrews 4.16. We look over there in those verses in chapter 10 of Hebrews at the progression of thought in verses 22 through to 25 where he says, one, let us draw near, two, let us hold fast, three, let us consider how to encourage or stir up one another to love and good works. The first our personal, a personal devotion to God. The next, a certain degree of consistency. And then last, a social obligation. Now, why is he writing about this? The book of Hebrews, speaking about the preeminence of Christ, but also about apostasy. And many people who forsake the assemblies do not consider the possibility of apostasy. Sometimes people think if they miss a class, it's no big deal. They miss the, the afternoon worship. Maybe that's not a big deal. It's a football game. But it is the first step away from God. And, of course, the book of Hebrews, as he's writing there, the concern is about their return to Judaism. And we see that some were giving up their fellowship with the church that had begun, and they had begun to apostatize. The purpose of this passage is the same as one earlier, Hebrews chapter 6, 4 through 8, to warn the readers by showing them what this sin is. 
For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away. To renew them again unto repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. People don't really think, perhaps, that there is no concern on the part of God when they do this. If I miss a worship service, if I miss a class, if I don't come to the fellowship, if they invite me to their home because the, the, the church is coming together, this is, this is a part of the whole Christian life. This is the Christian life. The idea of the assembling is the Christian life. That's the important thing that's being missed. Not just a check-in, you know, you punch, your, punch the clock, I made it to Sunday morning class, I made it to, to the services, I made it to Wednesday, I've, I've done all I need to do this week. The enormity of this willful and, in, in this case, continual to keep on sinning sinfulness is described as categorically unacceptable to God because one has not only trodden underfoot the Son of God, that sounds serious, but also dismissed the blood of Christ as unholy or unworthy. This is how God views those who forsake the assembling of ourselves together. So we can't think of this casually or in a trivial manner or in a very selfish way. Matthew 22 and verse 37, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. We consider a verse like that when we forsake the assembly. Are we showing a love for God? You know, some have come under the, the notion, the conclusion, the false notion, really, that forsaking the assembly only refers to the Sunday morning worship, nothing else. It's about our whole life. This, this idea perhaps comes, it may come from denominational thinking, a person coming up in a denomination or and maybe they simply see that going to church as a burden, an onerous task to complete. Maybe they're just uninformed. But the language of the text is unambiguous as it relates to any and all assemblies that are cooperatively acceptable to the congregation. A coming together, when ye come together. Paul uses the phrase, when ye come together, several times in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and 12. When ye come together as the church. Referencing several activities in, in the worship and, with, and without. And we see the example of the brethren in Acts chapter 2 going daily from house to house. What is that? They're assembling. And allow them to maintain a commonality, a, a, a fellowship among themselves that would have been impossible if they were renegade defectors forsaking the day-to-day -day assembly. We think about... God's people marching around Jericho. And those who may have decided that they were just a little too busy, they had relatives in town. It's too hot, I don't feel like it. Who's preaching this afternoon? I 
I'm just not marching around Jericho today. I'm just not going to do it. No big deal. The brethren won't mind. They'll come looking for me, calling me. You know, brethren are good for answering their cell phones and texts until they miss that Sunday. You can't get a hold of them. Any other time, you send them a text and they get right back at you. Oh, Sister Sally, where were you today? Flatline. Whatever the reasons, the excuses that some brethren, you know, were in the habit of neglecting their responsibility of meeting together for worship, for fellowship, and though uh, those reasons are not spelled out in the Hebrew text, they are essentially immaterial. It really doesn't matter. really doesn't matter. God has never, God has never accepted excuses. You know, Moses thought he had some excuses lined up, didn't he? Now, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. Oh, no. What am I going to say? Who am I? Later chapters strongly hint at factors that may have been at work in terms of the Hebrew letter. But when we read in the scriptures of those people who deliberately and persistently abandon the fellowship of Christian believers, let us know that they are sinning. And anyone who neglects or forsakes, or the term, of course, leaving in the lurch, or leaving the work to others, and that's what it, that's what it is. Leaving other brethren in the lurch, just as Paul was speaking about Demas. He hath forsaken me. He's left the rest of the work to me. Having loved this present world. This stern admonition is not quite, it's put unmistakably strongly. The failure of some to continue attending all the gatherings of the brethren, that's a reflection on our Christian character. It's characterized not simply as neglect, but wrongful abandonment. Now, we understand abandonment when we hear it in certain situations. And we might not want to associate it this way, but I'm going to do it anyway. When you, you hear about a mother who has forsaken or abandoned a baby in a trash can, you have a certain feeling about it. You have a strong reaction to that. Who would do such a thing to their children? And though it's a different context, I understand, and, and you do too, but it is almost essentially uh, the same thing when you abandon your brethren in their assemblies. To abandon, to forsake. So brethren today who remove themselves from the fellowship of the Lord and his people are in serious danger of external uh, of eternal damnation eternal punishment should not only repent but flee from this mindset that stymies their spiritual growth and influence to forsake the assembling of the saints is a sin I, I think congregations do speak about that but perhaps we should see more brethren repenting of that and when you forsake an assembly, you should come forward and say, I forsook the assembly and I repent of that sin. You know, usually or normally what brethren do is they slink in the back like a snake and hope that you didn't miss them or didn't know that they were there. To forsake the assembling is a sin, and that, that assembling includes 
classes, fellowships, worships, but it's certainly not limited to those things. Any activity of the church is an assembly. It may not be the worship, but it's certainly a coming together and gathering of the brethren. And every New Testament Christian should be there when the church meets. Well, the virus continues to spread. Johnny gave us back a minute and three seconds. I think this is the first time in my life that I've been to a lectureship that so many preachers have given back time. Either they're losing their zeal or they're just pooping out or they're getting too old to move. I don't know what, what it is. But regardless of that, Johnny, that was a great sermon. And think about it, brethren. As long as people are people and the church is on this earth, I predict we will have to preach like this because there's just going to be members who just don't see it's that important to be at all of the assemblies of the saints. And they don't really feel pricked in their conscience when they choose something else over and above and besides assembling the saints or doing the work of the church.